this, Terry? Uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, Dr. Steve Lacey, and and I was wondering if you'd like to go with uh, with me down to the secret hideout of Butch Cassidy. I'm taking uh, 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 Matt Warner, uh, not Matt Warner, Matt uh, Ward from uh, Sun Advocate, and uh, Phil Lyman, who's the county commissioner from uh, San Juan County, and uh, we're going to the secret hideout of Butch Cassidy. And it's was thought you might like to go along. Steve, man, you don't know how bad I'd like to do that, because I know you're the leading authority on Butch Cassie and the Suntance Kid, and I know you got a lot to share, and I'm there. I don't care when or when it is. I'm there. Yeah, I want to go. When Matt uh, first came to Christ, the courthouse wasn't finished until 1909 and so that's where the jail was eventually uh, put but before then any of the prisoners and stuff were, were, were put in here and uh, so uh, I don't think Matt had anything to do with it but any outlaws uh, probably Gunplay Maxwell may have been in here when they got drunk uh, Maybe Joe Walker was here, um, but when they brought the uh, the dead bodies to Price uh, of Johnny Herring and Joe Walker and the other two prisoners, they kept them in here because they didn't know who they were for sure, because this one was down there, and they had uh, some uh, bars. There was a bar that went straight down here so that there was uh, two cells on this side and two cells on this other side uh, so that there was a thing that went right through here and then there was a uh, uh, pot belly stove right in the center that kept it uh, warm then they had the windows that was in inside there but it was a nice cozy uh, thing but it was originally downtown it was moved across the street from this place here and then it was moved over here in the 1970s but it's a, a, a cool jail I lo uh, liked it I would love to have it this was Matt Warner's uh, one of his bars in Carbonville here this is where the door was and we have a photo of Matt He's sitting here with his buddies uh, at the bar, and I also have a picture of inside the bar because it was the cinder blocks that was in, inside, but he's sitting right out, outside with his, his buddies. It's a neat old building that it was not painted. This is where he had one of his bars. He had another bar in, in Price, but this is one of his bars that he had. And there was a lot of excitement going on. In the early days, this is where the main road was. Uh, and there was a lot of traffic and a lot of people came. To Matt Warner put his signature in this rock in February uh, 17th, 1920. And the reason why he was here, he was out uh, checking on some cattle that he had. And he was in a buckboard with Eck Hambrick. And there was a flash flood, and it seems real strange that there was a flash flood in February, but apparently there was, and he couldn't go any further with the flash flood, and so he put his signature in the rock, and he did the, the cow uh, up here, and at Cambric, uh, just a little further to the right and up, he put his signature in at the same time. One thing that Matt always told his daughter Joyce when he was out here, a posse was chasing him and they had shot his horse. And Matt uh, went with that horse as far as he could and he rode and rode and rode and finally the horse fell dead. And uh, Matt uh, thought he was going to get uh, uh, arrested, uh, get shot. He saw a lone cottonwood tree and 
in this location there's a, f a bunch of cottonwood trees but where he was at there was just one lone lot of cottonwood tree and so he he grabbed his saddlebags and his rifle and climbed that lone cottonwood tree and he was so much ahead of the the posse that was looking for him and uh, um, once he got up to the tree, he saw that there was a, a small little cave that you couldn't see from down below. So he hurried up and got down from the tree and crawled up into the little uh, overhang. And when he got in inside of it, it looked like um, salt sacks was in there. It was like 30 salt sacks. And uh, anyway, he lay on the floor and that posse finally came by and they searched and searched and searched but there was quite a bit of rocks and stuff around so there wasn't any tracks and finally after hours of, of them searching they couldn't find Matt and they took off well when Matt finally got to stirring around he realized it was gold dust in those sacks and of course he was on foot he put a couple of those in his saddlebags and and some down his pants and took off and when you're on the run uh, you don't remember uh, landmarks and details, but he always told his daughter that when he came out to the San Rafael area, he was trying to locate that place. And maybe the person that hid them in the first place came and got them. Uh, maybe not. Maybe they're still there. But uh, that's what he told his daughter, and I've been telling this story for many years now. So you think it was this area right around in here well, somewhere? Well, I don't know if it was around here or not, but he he came out to the San Rafael uh, a lot, huh? a lot, trying to look for this. And he also, uh, they were doing uranium uh, out here in the 20s and the 30s, and uh, even in the teens because uh, Madame Curie was uh, uh, looking to find uh, uranium to make uh, uh, radium. And so she got uh, radium, I believe it was from Emory County. Hmm. You know, so he spent quite a bit of time uh, uh, out here. Matt was always trying to figure out ways to make money because he had a, a hard life, you know, with no skills that he had uh, when he was in prison. He didn't learn any skills because he was uh, telling too many stories while he was in prison and the warden's wife always made baked him cherry pies or apple pies and uh, so he didn't do any work in the prison but uh, and didn't learn any skills and the only skills that they taught him how to do was make brooms or uh, or how to do leather work and uh, he didn't do, do any of that so uh, he didn't learn any skills while he was in prison. What was Hambrick's story? What was his uh, favorite? Hambrick was Tom McCarty's uh, uh, nephew and uh, Tom McCarty was uh, Billy McCarty's uh, stepson and uh, he was a minor outlaw and uh, he got killed in 1925 over in Ely, uh, Nevada a, uh, um, a bull uh, uh, gouged him and killed him and there's an author that has tied him to the Delta Colorado Bank job yeah, September 7th, 1893, Billy uh, McCarty and Billy's son, Fred, and Tom McCarty robbed the Delta Colorado Bank. And Billy and Fred were killed, and uh, Tom got away. And this author has tied uh, Eck Hambrick to it, but Eck was only 12, so he couldn't have been involved uh, in it because Eck was pretty small, stature-wise, and uh, even holding horses, he wouldn't have been able to uh, uh, do it. And uh, he wasn't even in the, in the area. But Billy McCarty, at the top of his head, was completely blown off. And they took his picture without the hat and put a hat on it to make him look presentable. And Fred was uh, shot and killed. And uh, Tom threatened to kill uh, uh, William Ray Simpson, who shot and killed him, uh, both that he was going to come back and kill him. Uh, William Ray Simpson was a hardware uh, worker that lived across the street. Uh, the store was, and he grabbed his rifle and uh, shot him in the alley. 
And uh, had he had a few more seconds, he probably would have got Tom also, but Tom got away and, and no one seems to know what happened to him. Uh, but his two sons, um, uh, Lou McCarty and Lynn McCarty, uh, were around. Lou McCarty is the one that uh, uh, was also an outlaw. He was with Matt on a number of occasions up in Wyoming, and and he was doing things in Utah and got into uh, uh, a lot of trouble. And he served time at the Utah State Prison. I found his mugshot, and uh, I showed it to uh, a uh, writer, and he told everybody it was Tom McCarty. And he shared it with somebody, and they had it on their front cover of the of their book hmm. said this is Tom McCarty it wasn't it was Lou McCarty in 1915 and that's what happens when you have pretend writers and pretend historic historians that are uh, making up things that they don't know what they're talking about hmm. right here is where uh, Matt had one of his uh, speakeasies and it was with one of his uh, it was with his son-in-law John Cosher and he spent time uh, here, and some of his many practical jokes took place right here. And uh, uh, he spent a lot of time uh, here, and just a block away is where he had a shootout with uh, Sheriff, the former Sheriff John Pope from Vernal. Matt was always mad about uh, him, hated him. He's the one that took him over to uh, Vernal for trial and uh, they hated each other. And Matt's wife, Elma, knew that uh, uh, Polk was in town and so she hurried up and hid his gu uh, guns. And Matt finally got a hold of a gun and right over here where the sheriff's office here in Price is located now was a lumber yard and uh, they were firing each, each other, but they uh, knew that had they uh, shot one another that they'd be in trouble, that they would go to, uh, to jail and possibly prison had they shot and killed each other. And uh, so they were shooting at one another, and that's so close to town right now that uh, they'd have been in major trouble. But they didn't get in trouble for shooting their guns in town. Uh. This was in the, uh, the late 20s, early 30s. And two old men uh, firing their guns at him. Okay. This is where Matt Warner was uh, buried. The horse uh, without the rider. So. And uh, I have a picture of Matt Warner uh, wearing a suit. And it's the same suit that he was buried in. Uh, Matt Warner was, uh, uh, he loved to tell a story, and sometimes he added a little bit of flavor to it. But uh, he always uh, said that his stories, uh, he wanted to encourage the, uh, the people not to... Uh, uh, get involved in crime because uh, he paid uh, a heavy price because when you robbed and you were on the run you couldn't build a fire because uh, uh, the smoke would let uh, posse know where you were at you always had to camp uh, with your back against a rock uh, so that nobody would come up against you and uh, a lot of times it was raining and cold in the winter time awful cold and uh, uh, you didn't know where your next meal was coming and uh, Matt Warner in later years uh, always ate his dessert first because when you're on the run you don't you're not guaranteed that you're going to get your dessert so he always ate his dessert first to make sure that he mm -hmm. got it. And um, anyway, uh, in many ways, he was he was a good person. And uh, other ways, uh, he uh, he demanded perfection. And uh, he was uh, 
I feel like I, I know him. You know, one night I had a dream about him. You know, I've never had a dream about somebody I've never met before. And I had a dream about him. It was like he was just sitting right next to me and he was asked questions. And, huh. and I, uh, I told him, I said, you know, Joyce, uh, your daughter has always tried to... Uh, 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 make you proud and uh, and for people to remember you and he says that's really nice and that was all he said but it was just like he was just the presence that was huh. there yeah and I've never had that kind of a dream about huh. anyone before yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, Matt's grandson says I'm jealous because I've never had a, a dream like that <laughs> and uh, he knew Matt uh, he had, was only three when Matt died, uh, so he remembers him a little bit. Uh, in fact, one story that he told me, he says, I remember getting a spanking from Matt because I took the new broom and put it in the ditch out in front and was uh, floating it under the uh, culvert in front of the house, and uh, uh, Matt grabbed the broom and he gave me a spank and he says I remember getting a spanking from Matt Warner so but uh, Matt liked uh, his uh, grandkids he, he liked young kids and uh, but uh, there was other times he was he was pretty mean if the horse didn't work wasn't dependable uh, he got rid of it if a gun was not dependable he threw it away uh, because if you didn't have a trusty uh, gun, it wasn't worth it. So I have a lot of respect for uh, Matt Warner, and uh, at least he did one uh, a good thing. He reformed when he uh, got out of prison. Uh, he may have done some bootlegging, but uh, at least he paid society back. And a lot of outlaws had never done that. Some of the other robbers, Roosh Gang, never paid society back. This is what's left on the outside of Matt Warner's house uh, that he lived in. And in 1939, November 21st, Butch Cassidy visited with Matt Warner's widow, Elma and his uh, uh, Matt Warner's daughter Joyce and spent the day visiting off and on and this is the story that he told about uh, uh, Matt Warner's uh, activity an outlaw and his brothers uh, Dan Parker and Arthur Parker and Tom McCarty and uh, the early days with Billy McCarty and uh, Sundance, and uh, this is the outside of the of the house. But he uh, spent quite a bit of time that one full day, and he kept leaving and coming back and leaving and coming back. Um, Joyce said he felt she felt that maybe he had a bladder problem, but was afraid to ask to use the bathroom. Hmm. He had come. Uh, 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 he rode on the railroad. He had a pass. He worked for the railroad for over 20 years. He had retired from the railroad. And he got here to Price uh, because he had read a co uh, Cosmopolitan magazine. The magazine was 11 months old, and he thought that uh, Matt was still alive. He was going to go visit his old friend. And he got down here to the Price uh, train station and asked where he could find Matt Warner, and he said he, Matt died 11 months ago. But he came and saw um, Joyce and her mother, and he also saw uh, Matt Warner's other daughter, uh, Hayda, and uh, he had met her before when she was a young girl. Um, and this is the house. It's a really cool place inside, and you can see where he sat and where the fireplace was, and it's just a cool place.
and now it's kind of sandwiched in between these two businesses, this yeah. tire shop or whatever this is. There's a tire shop on one side, and Pisa Printing uh, had added on and had a print shop here for years and years and years, and now the, the building's closed because Pisa Printing moved uh, somewhere else, and there was another print shop here uh, uh, over a year ago, and now it's, it's empty. Right after Matt had died, uh, Boyle, uh, Matt's son, had already been married, and Gila was already married. Uh, Matt's wife, Elma, took in boarders to help make ends meet, and that's the reason why it was such a uh, large house. And then uh, later on, uh, they sold the house and got a smaller uh, house. But for a while there, they took in boarders to help make ends meet. And they, uh, Elma sold uh, Avon and, and peddled uh, Matt Warner's book, Last of the Bandit Riders. And uh, that's how they made uh, ends meet. Yep. Okay. This is where they buried the outlaws, just outside of the cemetery here in Price. And you will notice it has C.L. Uh, Maxwell, Gunplay Maxwell. He's not buried here. Hmm. They think, uh, a lot of people think he's buried here, but uh, he was uh, killed by uh, um, shoot him up Bill Johnson in 1909, but he's buried in Salt Lake. There's uh, some pretend historians that will tell you that he's buried here, but he isn't. Joe Walker and John Johnny Herring, his name was not John Her uh, Herring, but Johnny Herring, and they were the two that were positively identified as robbing the Castlegate Mine payroll in uh, uh, April 21st, 1897. But they were killed in uh, May of 1898. And this John uh, uh, Montes uh, was buried here. And uh, in 1973, when they were enlarging the cemetery, they dug up these three men. And uh, I happened to be here when they were uh, digging them up. and. Uh, one of the main reasons why is they wanted to see the skeletons. Uh, they didn't really have to uh, identify them, but they uh, needed somebody to help identify the bodies. But uh, Matt Warner, when he came up to Decoration uh, Day and put flowers on his relatives' uh, graves and his wife's uh, relatives, they uh, he always went over the fence because there was a barbed bar wire fence. When I was in college, there was a barbed bar wire fence. And all it stuck up was a lead pipe that showed where the grave was. And uh, he'd put uh, a bunch of lilacs on their grave every year. And uh, because he knew, uh, uh, well, I'm not sure that he knew uh, uh, Joe Walker and Johnny Herring, uh, but he knew the... Uh, John Montes, and uh, but he felt that they needed some flowers on the grave. So th this kind of a mass burial here, then, of a bunch of outlaws, or just, just these, three. just these just three, three uh, that they uh, put here. And uh, Joe Walker's grave, uh, his body was pretty well intact, and uh, uh, Johnny Herring's body uh, was all uh, all apart. And um, in the early days, uh, when they were trying to identify, they thought Johnny Herring was uh, Butch Cassidy. They had buried him a couple of times and dug him up. Uh, that was before embalming. And so uh, they took photographs of them uh, uh, later so that they didn't have to dig him up again because they were starting to get a little ripe. And... Um, Anyway, uh, they found out that Johnny Herring was not Butch Cassidy, but uh, he looked like Butch Cassidy. And because the pl uh, he wasn't Butch Cassidy, but he was positively identified as uh, uh, one of the robbers, 
the Pleasant Valley Coal Company would not pay the reward for him or Joe Walker for robbing the Castlegate Mine payroll robbery. Because they thought it was Butch Cassidy or they something? They thought it was Butch Cassidy, and since it wasn't Butch Cassidy, they wouldn't pay the reward. So how do we know it was these guys that robbed it instead of Butch Cassidy? Because uh, uh, the men that had uh, positively identified these two men as the ones who had robbed them. Ah, okay. They signed affidavits. I have copies of the affidavits to prove that they said that these two men were, were the ones that, uh, that positively uh, had robbed them. It was not Butch Cassidy. It was not Elsa Lay. So, and there's some more uh, writing on the back of the headstone here. Right up to right straight up here. It's got kind of a snake with it. Okay, I think I see it. This and is, and that too? That's uh, a minor outlaw right straight up here. And he was with Matt Warner when he carved his yeah, name? same day. And see, they were in a buckboard. Uh, uh, and they brought the buckboard right, right up to here. And they had to wait until the... Uh, because the road, I guess, probably went a little closer down here and they couldn't get past. But I filmed here with uh, uh, KSL. We drove down and then the next time we went to Robber's Roost we took Chopper 5. <laughs> cool. We used to have a roulette table in, uh, at the Savoy Hotel that used to be right here. Oh yeah? And uh, in 1938, J. Bracken Lee had them raid the Savoy Hotel and because it had gambling. And uh, he said, save me the wheel off of the roulette table. And so he made it look like a captain's wheel with a mirror in it. Really? Hung in his home in Price. It hung in the governor's mansion, hung in his home in Salt Lake. And one day he said, Steve, would you like to have it? I said, well, sure, and I got it in my museum in uh, Murray. So that's how, you know, you have a connection with Jay Bracken Lee. You know, you've said that you don't do anything without having a connection, and Jay Bracken Lee was from Price area? He was from Price. I didn't know that. Yeah, and he was mayor of Price for 12 years, and him and uh, Matt Warner went on the radio together in 1938 on KSL's uh, Empire Edition to promote the first Robber's Roost Roundup. Ah, yeah, I didn't know that. I know you did deal that documentary on him that was up for nominations of... It was uh, one best documentary for 1989 and was also nominated for an Emmy. Cool, I did this is one of the structures that uh, is just up the hill from where Butch Cassidy put his signature uh, in the rock. And one of the structures is, is uh, made of mud. And you look at the insulation that is on it, it's, uh, it's probably about 14, 15 inches thick. And uh, they packed the mud in there. Uh, there's plenty of rocks and stuff around here that they uh, mixed it in with it, but the mud, uh, once it hardened, was really uh, hard and it insulated, especially in the winter time. And during the summertime, it was probably pretty good too, because it was probably pretty cool inside the uh, the house. And this may have been kind of a little store. Uh, that they had, or a little office. It looks like that there was a little bit of an outcropping of coal that was uh, here. And like I've uh, mentioned before, uh, Butch Cassidy, I'm sure, came right through here uh, and stopped because there was a little bit of water here and there was company of the people that were here. And uh, this is all fallen in. It, it's only been the last... Uh, 
couple of years that this has all fallen in because this was all erect. When I first started coming out here in 1975, this was still up. But uh, the weather has uh, just finally uh, eroded away, and eventually there won't be anything that's left to say that somebody was here. Uh, uh, life goes on, and, uh, and uh, everything, uh, finally, uh, uh, nature takes over, and uh, it disappears. And that's why we got to document things before it's yeah, disappeared. Right. It's important that everything is documented. And that's part of the trip that we've been uh, taking. Uh, I've been trying to show where uh, Butch Cassidy and the Robber's Roost Gang, remember there was no Wild Bunch. The name didn't come into effect until 1902, long after the gang broke up because uh, uh, the officials started using the name in 1902 after a dime store novelist started using it. And uh, uh, the Pinkerton started using it in 1902, long after the gang had broke up and headed down south to South America. This is Butch Cassidy's signature in the rock. You can see the, the top of the B. I won't touch it because it is so fragile now. When I first started coming out here in 1975, these were all clear and it's not going to take much to knock these off. This is sandstone. Uh, Butch had to have uh, darkened these with charcoal from the campfire and then took a rock and uh, knocked off uh, with sand so that those would stick out. And he spelled Cassidy with an with an A because he hadn't decided how he wanted to spell Cassidy with an A or an I. And uh, he was traveling through Wayne County uh, up through here and uh, he camped out underneath here. Um, a few years back, I camped out underneath here and had a dinner uh, with a friend of mine. And I got to walking out, way out here, and I found two purple whiskey bottles. And uh, I bet they were uh, here when Butch was because they had turned purple. And any bottle that was... Uh, uh, purple had to been made before 1916, and I'll bet they were from the 1890s. And uh, uh, Butch had camped out overnight. He may have camped here on several occasions because there would have been a little bit of water here uh, during the, the winter time or after a rain because there was puddles of water so that his horse uh, uh, could rest up and, and so forth. And it's a shame because people have come here and uh, I'm sure have tried to do a rubbing of the signature here. And that's the reason why that the things are starting to fall off. The H, you can hardly see. The C, uh, it's in, in, in terrible shape. But uh, we're here to uh, uh, document this before it's completely gone. And, um, you know, uh, this was at a period of time when Butch was not uh, uh, wanted for the law. He did not rob the Castlegate Mine payroll robbery. He was down here in Loa at the time when the Castlegate Mine payroll robbery uh, took place. And he told uh, a reporter from the Salt Lake Tribune and the Salt Lake Herald that he could prove that he was not involved in the uh, Castlegate Mine payroll robbery. And this could have been around the same time when he left. Loa to come up and he camped out here and there's this cabin that we showed you earlier that he stopped by for for more water and and conversation uh, with the people that he visited with and everything and that could possibly be the time that he put this uh, here and he was just taking his time uh, he could have been down to uh, uh, Fruta, Utah which is part of Bryce Canyon where uh, there's water down there, there's fruit trees, there's a Mormon colony that was down there that he spent time with. And uh, uh, so he, he spent a lot of time through here. In his early days, they moved cattle back and forth uh, throughout here that they had rustled. 
And uh, so he knew the area really well and uh, the different places to stop and, and so forth. So this is, this is kind of an out-of-the-way trail from somewhere to somewhere else, that this is a back route, highway well, route? or Well, because Loa and uh, Wayne County is not too far away, and uh, also you can head down through this way and go down to uh, Hanksville and, and uh, through the back door. Uh, as we call it, and uh, so he knew a lot of these people that were out in the out in the rural areas, and uh -huh. so he spent time uh, there just moseying around, figuring out what he was going to do next. Cool. So okay. this structure right behind us was kind of a way station from where Butch Cassidy put his uh, signature in a rock down the road, and. Uh, Butch stopped here. There's other structures along the way here. Uh, anywhere there was a building when, where people came in the old days, uh, if you weren't on the run from the, uh, from the law at that particular time, you stopped where there might be water, where there might be uh, extra food, because usually people took you in and, and gave you some beans, a uh, little bread, whatever. And company, and this is probably, uh, I'm sure that Butch stopped here, and other outlaws, because uh, they looked for company, and uh, made friends along the way. They did not put five dollar gold pieces under the plates, because they did not have a lot of money to be putting underneath the, the plates. That may have happened once or twice, but it didn't happen the majority of the time. Ah, yeah, you hear a lot of stories of that yeah. happen, but yeah, but it didn't happen because uh, it it just didn't happen. Do you, do you think they would visit out of the way places like this? Do you think they, they'd stay away from people because they knew they was wanted? Well, of course, did, I guess if they was out of the way, if they, they couldn't the call way, the sheriffs or anything. Well, there or, was no there was no electricity out here, but they uh, wanted company, and these people had water. Yeah, and had developed, and so usually it's where where there was water and and friendship, and and if they could spare some uh, supplies and and so forth, a lot of times they did pay for their supplies and uh, and everything. So it was a two way street. They uh, they helped one another. Right, right down he, uh, here, uh, we're we're nearing where there were signatures in the rock, and it's about five miles from where the hideout of Butch Cassidy and Elzele uh, had in 1896 and 1897, the winter of 1896 uh, uh, and 1897. And uh, my father, in 1954, found a magazine under a rock. The magazine was from the 1890s, and the guy had wrote on there, I wonder who will find this, and he signed his name to it. And... Uh, we lived in Wellington, above my grandparents' uh, beer joint. It was called the Lacey Club. And my grandparents lived uh, in an apartment that hooked right onto the beer joint. And that magazine uh, transpired back and forth, back and forth. And uh, I was pretty young at the time. And I remember the magazine, but I can't remember the name. My dad couldn't remember the name. But we talked about this for years and years about coming out here. I wished I knew who wrote uh, the name because I probably would recognize the name now with all of the 58 years of, of doing research on the Roberts Roost Gang. But in 1984, I convinced my dad uh, to show me uh, this area, and he remembered this. And uh, we came out, and uh, there's signatures in the rock here of other outlaws. And then we went to the hideout, which is uh, five miles away, and uh, we'll show it to you a, a little bit later. Is this? this is Al Acres. Oh, I see the finger. Okay. Al Acres. Yeah. He's around a dozen that uh, Hebram Wells had rewards for him. Uh, of the outlaws that were wanted and uh, this is his signature here and it was a little darker there what we did is put some water on there to make those kind of pop out a little bit and then there's others 
better here. There's some of their stuff that have popped it. I need to put my glasses on. So, why do you think that hand is there and pointing? It's pointing to something that... Is that way? Yeah, that, that was that way. And uh, there's the 1897 signature that was was here. But you get right over here. And uh, Ella Butler... Mr. Butler, which is Mont Butler, and this is 1897, and somebody has went around there, re-scratched it, re-scratched it, and kind of terrible messed it up. Um, and then there's another one of Mont Butler that's here. There's Ella Butler that's that's over there, and uh, but anyway. Uh, Butch Cassidy was supposed to have come down here with at a place, and uh, 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 Elzalev came with his common law um, wife. I don't think they officially got married, Maud Davis. And uh, uh, Maud Davis said that it was at a place. And I don't believe it was at a place because at a place would have been about 15 years old at the time. Mm. And so. It was Ella Butler that had come uh, down here at that particular time. She was from Placerville, Colorado, and so was uh, Mont Butler. And when you come right over here, you'll see Ella Butler. And there's the rest of it. And then uh, uh, there's Mont Butler here, too. But there was uh, three other... There was a total of three outlaws that had been here besides Butch and Elzalay. Butch and Elzalay did not put their signature in here, and neither did Maud Davis, but uh, Ella Butler did. Oh, here they put Placerville, and it's for uh, Colorado. There's Ella Butler again. When they didn't have uh, a whole lot of things going on, you could see them bringing themselves down here uh, kind of courtship and uh, exploring and with uh, the official secret hideout is five miles away from here. Uh, they had a lot of free time on the hands riding their horse down here and uh, putting their name in this signature. It was cool. You can see, feel right in here in the hot of the day that it is nice and cool. Oh, here's, here's the rest of Mont. M O N T, and there's the charcoal that they put in with it. Mont Butler. Uh, I've been around a long time to uh, to tell when uh, the signatures are. There's a different style of when they put their signatures in. It's like when we went and looked at Butch Cassidy's signature. You can definitely tell that that was put in uh, in the 1890s because of the way it was uh, carved in there. And even though Cassidy is spelled with an A instead of an I, you definitely know that it's from that particular time period. And Butch hadn't finally decided how he wanted to, it spelled. And then, uh, you know, you, you experiment. You know, uh, my younger brother, he wrote his name on everything. We had an old uh, freezer, and he put his name on there. And... Uh, we disposed of that, and I always worried that someone would find that re uh, freezer and come back uh, because I had illegally uh, disposed of that freezer, and uh, no one will come back on us because somebody came and took it, and I'm sure that they used it as a uh, feeding trough for their cows, took the lid off, and, and put uh, hay in it or water in it because it would uh, hold the water, but I was worried because he wrote his name on everything, and and uh, you'll kill me for saying all this uh, on on uh, YouTube, but uh, the outlaws experimented, and that's the reason why they wrote their names in the rocks, because they wanted people to know that they were, were there. And besides, they didn't have a whole lot to do. But you can definitely tell style from the 1890s to uh, the 20s and 30s, because they taught handwriting and penmanship. And uh, it's important, and that's how you can tell uh, when there's signatures in a rock. 
uh, or signatures in the trees and, and stuff because they don't teach penmanship now and and the handwriting is not the same. So you was talking about a tree that was found in the vernal area. Oh, in the vernal uh, areas, there's two tr trees. One says uh, Butch Cassidy on it, and the other one says uh, Sundance Kid. It's not them because uh, you can definitely tell that it was put on in the 1970s, uh, early 70s, right after the movie of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And I don't know how many times people have taken pictures of that and and sent me copies and said, oh, there's Butch Cassidy's signature and, and uh, Sundance is in the trees. Well, Sundance wasn't even in the UN as first off, and uh, the style is just not the same as the tree uh, as what they would have done in the, that particular time period, and so uh, I definitely know that those are not there. And then you can de definitely tell uh, the scars in the trees in the Quakies. Uh, the scars would have been a lot different, and uh, uh, when my father put scar. Uh, his name on the Quakies in the 50s and we went back uh, 25, 30 years later and you look at those scars, the scars are a lot different than the, they were in the 70s and stuff and those ones that, that says Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid uh, are awkward and they're not original. When I first came here in 84 there used to be a horse collar that was hanging right here uh, from wire and that's why there's an indication that this is where uh, Butch and Elza Lay kept their horses. There's probably three or four horses in here. They could keep the horses full with their saddles on so that they could take off at a moment's notice. And uh, they would have horse collars on the two uh, horses or mules that they had for the wagon so that they could take off at a moment's notice. And uh, so that gives an indication. This is part of that uh, place that my father found. And it, like I said, it's five miles from where that signatures are in the rock. But it's an awesome place because uh, you know, out in this desert area, it was c cool. Uh, it's cool right now. We're in uh, in August, and uh, and in a rainstorm, it would keep those horses uh, uh, out of the weather, but it would keep them cool. And uh, during the winter time, uh, it would keep them protected and and so forth. And they could bring a. a food up here for them and then the bottom of this here is kind of blocked off a little bit and there'd be water here for them and then they could take them out and uh, there's a little field right nearby and uh, uh, get them uh, exercise so that they weren't just bunched up here all the time. So I really think this is uh, the place where they kept them and you can look out over and uh, if there's any law coming in here they can be saddled up and, and away they go. It's an ideal place and I'm thankful that my father was able to find this in 1954. Right here is what's left of the buckboard. They took the buckboard off of the wa uh, wagon and put it right down here for the bottom of their tent. Uh, probably Butch was, uh, well it may not have been Butch, it might have been just for Elza Lay and Maud Davis because they were newly married or uh, shacked up, whatever it was, and uh, this is where the tent wa was because originally when I first came here in 84, the tent posts were still here and one of the tent posts is right over there and uh, this is all sloughed up. There may be things underneath here uh, if this was all dug out, but you can see what's left. That's definitely part of the buckboard and uh, the tent was here. It was an ideal place uh, and there's a stove laying over there that they cooked on 
and uh, I don't know what the configuration uh, during the winter time it would be nice and toasty in that tent and I'll, I suspect the day-to-day -day activities when Butch and uh, Ella Butler were up here uh, in the little cave uh, they probably spent most of their time in the cold uh, winter where the stove was but at night they probably were in that cave and and had a fire and stuff right by it but uh, it was a nice nice location because they were here from uh, the fall of 1896 till the spring of 1897 and people are going to say oh and that's when uh, Butch and El Zalay went and robbed the Castle Gate mine payroll robbery but they didn't it was Joe Walker and Johnny Herring because they were positively identified as the two men who had robbed the Castle Gate mine payroll robbery. This is where uh, uh, Butch Cassidy and uh, Ella Butler probably spent a, a, a good percentage of the winter of 1896 and 1897. Uh, this stuff in here was not all sloughed off, but this is probably where they camped and there was fire, place for fire here, place for fire right here would have been nice and comfortable they could have had a lean-to uh, uh, here with canvas and so forth and ideal place it had been out of the uh, wind out of the rain uh, just an ideal place and who's going to find it unless there's a lot of uh, tracks around and uh, most people wouldn't know where it's about uh, the ideal thing about these uh, outlaws, uh, when you got out in the middle of nowhere, most of the law uh, officers were not after them. When they are only getting $20, $30 a month as pay, they're not going to go out into uh, the robber's roost area. And I call robber's roost anywhere from uh, uh, above uh, the Dirty Devil or uh, Barrier Canyon. Uh, to risk your life for thirty, forty dollars a a month. Uh, that's not a lot of money to risk your life. And and I figured, well, if they're out here, they're not causing anybody any problems. And so they didn't really chase after them, unless somebody killed somebody. Then they might go after them. Or if it was a big payroll, and they uh, posse went after uh, uh, Joe Walker and Johnny Herring. But they didn't come all the way down here because, uh, like I said, uh, they were still afraid. Most of them were pretty amateurs that were in the posse, and they couldn't get, get guarantee that they were going to get anything because uh, they only collected rewards because they didn't get paid if they uh, didn't collect anything. And so uh, it was a rough time uh, for them. But, like I said, this is a place for Butch and uh, Elsley and uh, Sundance wasn't in this area when they were uh, outlaws um, but it's an ideal place I love this place every time I come out and then when we travel the five miles to where the signatures are in the rock it's such a beautiful place such cool in the summertime summertime when it's really hot this is still pretty cool and yeah, no. all and then uh, when there's a rainstorm it's just really nice if you're just hunkering down it's beautiful and steve man thank you for taking me to all these secret places thanks you're, you're welcome we need to to document all of this uh because uh, i'm not always going to be around and uh, there's not T today makes 19 people that are alive that knows where the secret hideout is there was more people that knew it but they've all passed on and uh, so needed to document it to, uh, to preserve it for uh, future generations but we've uh, also made sure that uh, a lot of people don't know exactly where it is because it's important to have it preserved well you know man we've traveled so many miles you know in the last few days hundreds of miles man and and you've taken us all to these crazy roundabout. I'm not even sure where we're at now. <laughs> yeah. Well, and every time that I come out here, uh, I'm not sure exactly where some uh, 
turnoff is, and then we've had to do some backtracking to get back out to uh, on the right road and and everything. And I've been out out to these places uh, lots and lots of times, and uh, and thankfully that my father brought me to this hideout in 1984, and that he had enough guts to remember from 1954 to 1984. Yeah, that'd be tough to do. Yeah. This is uh, where Matt Warner's uh, bar was. And in 1889, uh, there's a picture of Butch Cassidy, uh, Sundance Kid, Arthur Parker, uh, Dan Parker, Butch's brothers, Butch's uncle, Dan Gillis, Elza Lay, and Sheriff Favre's. And Matt Warner's in the picture, and it's a really cool picture. In fact, I will show you a picture of it. Uh, let me put this together. The bar was here until 1978, but they converted it into an apartment. They had changed the, the windows and the doors. It did some uh, remodeling and converting. It was really a cool cool place but if you look over here you can see where they have graded over here and found some of the purple bottles uh, from the shot glasses and the, the beer mugs they uh, they sold beer they sold uh, hard liquor it was a, an ideal uh, uh, place it was really cool when I saw it uh, but they tore it down uh, I guess it was becoming uh, dilapidated, but I was very privileged to, uh, to see it. I've, I'm glad I got, had a chance to see it. Okay, this is Matt Warner's uh, brothel and house, and uh, uh, he eventually sold it to uh, uh, Butch Cassidy's uncle. And Butch Cassidy's uncle uh, moved in here in 1900 and then the uh, uncle died in 1907 and uh, the widow lived in here I think until she died and uh, Butch Cassidy's uh, well Dan Gillis's uh, daughter lived here Una Gillis she lived in here until 1986 and this is where I met her and she's the one that gave me the picture of uh, Butch uh, from South America. The last known photo of uh, Butch that was taken in South America really? that is in my uh, book, the book that came out in 2000 and it will be in the new edition uh, of him and he's on a camping trip. Una uh, Gillis was here. She gave that to me. Uh, of uh, Butch, because Butch wrote to uh, Dan Gillis, uh, and uh, uh, Una couldn't find the letters that uh, Butch wrote, but she, she found the photo and gave it to me, and uh, she gave that letter to me in uh, 84, I think it was, something like that. Too tall. Hi, uh, Bob. Yeah. Steve Gracie. Yeah, I remember you, Steve. Yes. I haven't seen you forever. I know. It has been. How in the hell you been? I've been doing okay. I took these uh, group of people. This is uh, Matt Ward from the Sun Advocate. And hey, Tim how Carter you doing? With YouTube. Yeah. And we went down to Butch Cassidy's secret uh, hideout. And we how went you over and filmed it. Uh, Matt Warner's signature in the rock uh, down Buckhorn Draw. And we went to Butch Cassidy's uh, signature in the rock, and so we've been trying to document everything. And but I've been meaning to uh, to stop and talk to you. Yeah. And we thought we'd do some filming yeah. here, and I was going to come over and talk to you. Yeah. And uh, let me give you this. This tells I've got a new book coming out on Matt uh, Matt Warner, and this tells uh, about the new book that's coming out. It's going to have 183 new pages, and then tells about my museum in uh, Murray and then uh, tell us more about Butch Cassidy and 
I'm with Bob Gardner here, and uh, he owns uh, uh, Matt's uh, uh, brothel, and uh, we're looking at the picture of Matt's bar, and uh, this is uh, Sundance Kid, who was actually hiring BB, and there's Butch Cassidy. This is Butch's brother Arthur, who was an outlaw, and there's Dan Parker, who was the first outlaw of the bunch to get arrested and sent to federal prison. He was in federal prison, I believe, uh, seven years. And this is Butch's uncle, Dan Gillis. And uh, this picture was taken in 1889, but uh, uh, Butch's uncle, Dan Gillis, bought the brothel uh, from Matt Warner in uh, 1900 when he moved to Green River, Utah. This is Elza Lay. This is uh, Sheriff Farr. He's the one that they sent out of Robber's Roost without his pants on. But not without just his pants. They stripped him down naked. But Matt Warner cleaned it up and just said he sent him out of uh, Robber's Roost with just his underwear. And there's Matt Warner. So is that before or after this picture? It's before he sent him out. So, but now they're buddies? They're, they were they're, buddies. They're, okay. They were buddies. This was in 18... 89 is when this picture was taken because Matt Warner wrote on the back of the picture it was taken in 1889. So, and then I'm going to show you what, and that's your copy. Thank you. And this is what the new book is going to look like. I have a new cover. Uh, the last one, I didn't like what the, uh, my old publisher put together because I wanted to get back to what the original book looked like. There's Matt Warner, and there's uh, Matt Warner here, his prison picture, and Butch Cassidy. And see, it's a lot thicker, has much more material, and uh, it goes into a lot more detail. But this book isn't out yet, right? It's not out yet, uh -huh. but hopefully soon uh, we'll get it out, and you'll get a copy of that. And then I have a book that I'm going to autograph to you. It's called Posey. The Last Indian War, and uh, it was by me and Pearl Baker. Uh, Pearl and I worked on it, and Pearl died in 1992, and Matt Warner's daughter Joyce died in 1992, and and uh, we worked on the other book and everything. So I am so yeah. excited about visiting with you. This has been a good trip because we went all over the place, and. Uh, uh, Man, we've covered hundreds of miles. Yeah. We've been dozens of places. And, and, and I've come here <laughs> and, and brought other groups by, but you weren't home. But uh, but I'm so glad to uh, to see you this time. Yeah. And I'm going to autograph this book to you. Uh, but first, I'm going to show you. There I am wearing this coat. And this coat was uh, used in the movie Gone with the Wind. Clark Gable wore it. In the final scene, he says, Frankly, my dear, don't give a damn. And that coat is worth between $150,000 and $350,000 because Clark Gable said, Frankly, my dear, don't give a damn for a swear word. Yeah. And let me show you uh, this other picture. Um, the second to last Indian War took place in Bluff, Utah, on our property. This rock right here, this is the top of it, and we own 40 acres of land where the second to last Indian War took place. And there's my dad, Claude Lacey, and my mom, Thelma, and they're both dead. My dad died five years ago, my mom died in 2007. And there's me, my sister-in-law, and there's my youngest brother, Jim. And around the corner from here, we own some cliff dwellings on our property. But there's tons and tons of pictures that you'll find in here, and I hope that you will enjoy uh, reading it. Oh, I will. And my address is all over in there, and here, and on that card, and, and everything. Well, thank you, Steve. Appreciate everything yeah. I've learned from you. Yeah, this has been. You've been teaching me a lot. Yeah, this has been. <laughs> this has been so cool. This has been. The last two days have been so he, awesome he's for me. He's taught me a lot and showed me a lot of history that I had no clue went on in some of these towns oh, out in the out in the middle of nowhere. Just it's 
I think you go out here in this desert and do some walking in these canyons and stuff. Uh, like down here, there's W.W. W. Gillis where he stood on his wagon and put his name on the yeah. rock in that grease, huh. dated it. I think yeah. it's 1904. Huh. You know, and there's uh, down here, well, it used to be Watterson's, Jack Watterson's place down on the river. You go back up in that dead end canyon there. And there's four or five names they scratched in the rock with a horseshoe nail. Really? So, yeah. Wow. Cool. I, I, I love getting out here and looking. This. <laughs> this is cool. Yeah, I found a petroglyph that has an ostrich on it. Really? And I found another one that has an alligator on it. Really? Yep. Wow. That's interesting to me because yeah. I just heard of one in Wyoming that's a life-size body of a, of a person with an alligator head. Huh. And now you're saying there's one with an alligator this here. A, this is an alligator. Wow. Back up here in Stub Canyon. That's cool. Wow. This is awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it just keeps me um, keeps me interested looking at everything there is around here to see. Good. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, bud. Yeah. Well...